Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order at 535. As a reminder, there are two points for public comment this evening. If you're interested in submitting a public comment, please do so by submitting an email to superintendent at scglsd.org. Okay, in your packets, you should have a secretary's report dated 7-21-2020. I'll entertain a motion to accept those meeting minutes. So moved. <laughs> you take them, Ted. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be like from the past, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I second that motion. Okay. Any questions, comments, changes? Okay, we're going to do a roll call vote to accept that report. Chelsea? Yes. Ted? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes 600. Uh, warrants were emailed earlier today. Please take the time to review them, sign them, and send them back to Amy at your earliest convenience. And then we do not have any uh, correspondence this evening. It's time for our first public comment. Amy, if you could check the uh, email account, please. Yes, Chairman Hull, I do have one public comment from Ian Brown of Granville, Mass. And Mr. Brown's email says, how is the district able to provide adequate staffing with the current guidance regarding possible COVID-19 exposure of staff and requirements for them to quarantine or test negative? With concern and waiting your response, Ian Brown, parent of two students and a spouse of dis district employee. And that is the only public comment we have. No student advisory report. Educational presentation up first is Superintendent Willard on the initial reopening plan. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for participating and joining us uh, as we roll out our reopening plan for the fall of 2020. Uh, before I begin the presentation tonight, I need to just acknowledge and thank uh, some people who uh, really were instrumental in putting this plan together. I need to personally thank Jenny Sullivan, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Robin Gunn, our Director of Student Services, uh, Amy McLaughlin, who is instrumental in getting information out to families, uh, getting these PowerPoints up and just working tirelessly to uh, work on communicating with the communities. I need to thank Stephen Presno and Eric Wykander, who are working tirelessly on uh, computers and uh, sanitation for our schools and making them a safe place for everybody to come back to. Principals Tremel, Carrier, and Sasso, uh, who are working with uh, teacher leaders in their buildings. And a huge shout out uh, to the SEA union leadership who are giving up hours of their summer uh, on Zoom calls with uh, us at central office and at the schools, uh, working to bring a plan that best meets the needs of our students and staff by keeping them healthy and safe and providing the best educational possible for the students of the Southwick Town and Granville Regional School District. So I personally just wanna thank you and I applaud you for your work and your dedication to uh, our school district. And we are all lucky to have you. I'd like to start off uh, this with just, it's a short two minute video uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And it's a little summary of the guidance that we were given by the commissioner on the reopening of schools. Amy, we can't hear it. When we look 
look at how things are going related to COVID-19 in the state of Massachusetts, we actually have a lot to be optimistic about. We've done a phenomenal job of getting our rates of transmission down. We are viewed around the country as a leader in developing strategies to reduce the spread of infection. Getting our kids back to school is really only safe because we've gotten the rates of transmission down to a low level, low and, and continuing to, to drop. If we were in another state, we'd be having a different conversation. There will be important measures that are going to be implemented at each individual school to make sure that kids stay safe, kids and teachers. One of them will be social distancing. We're going to keep kids apart. We're going to rely heavily on the use of masks, which we know are highly effective at reducing transmission. We're going to rely on hand hygiene. We're going to really in, in require children to be washing their hands or using hand sanitizer frequently over the course of the school day. So one of the most important things that parents and families can do to support safe return to school is ensuring that they're only sending their children to school when they're well. Every day we want parents to ensure that their children don't have any symptoms that could be a sign of COVID. We know that classrooms are going to look different than they did last year. They're going to be configured in a way that's going to maximize the safety to both students and to teachers. The first difference that will be noticed is that the desks are going to be spaced further apart. We know that not every classroom will be able to achieve six feet of distancing, and that's safe provided that children who are in those classes, as well as the teachers, are wearing their mask. In addition, they're all going to be facing forward because we know that sideways transmission is rare. And with those strategies in place, distances shorter than six feet can still be done safely. So because of what we've learned about the virus itself, we feel comfortable that the plans that have been outlined are a safe and effective way for our children to return to school this fall. I'm an infectious disease physician, but I'm also a mom, and there is nothing more important to me than the safety of my kids. I really believe that we're putting together strategies that are going to protect our kids and the educators in the classroom to make it safe for them to go back to school. My children are going to be going back to school in the fall and I am really confident that they're going to be fine. Thank you. So that was just a quick summary of the guidelines that we were given about reopening the schools. And when we were given the guidelines, we were told that six feet uh, was the preference, but if you could do three feet, you could do three feet. I want to let you know from the uh, start, um, I would not start creating a plan that was anything less than six feet. I felt that if we were going to be going back to schools, we were going to provide the safest environment possible for our teachers and for our children. And so when we conducted uh, the pressure testing for the first plan, which was an all in person, uh, we realized we could fit all of our students back at school. However, it did have some limitations. For example, if we brought all of our students back, uh, we would have to hire over an additional 20 teachers in order to staff all the additional spaces that we would need to uh, convert into classrooms because we could have approximately 10 to 20 kids in a classroom depending on the size of the classroom. So we knew we were going to have to hire additional staff in order to make this plan work. The other issue that is uh, unique to our school district is the geographical size of our district and the uniqueness of our transportation. Uh, we're a very linear school district with our schools all being on one end of the geographic location of our school district. And so our students who uh, come to us from Tolland and West Granville have a very lengthy ride. And we would have to be doing multiple bus runs in order to accommodate all of our children uh, in an in-person everyday model. So looking at the in-person, it could be done, but it wasn't fiscally responsible, nor would it work because we would have to do so many uh, tiered bus runs that some students wouldn't get to school until 11.30, 12 o'clock, uh, depending on the school that they attended. So the next plan that we looked at was a hybrid plan. This was a part in-person plan and a part remote. 
And this was looking at how many of our students could we get back to school on a daily basis that were the most dependent learners. We also wanted to make sure that we had additional support in as many in learning days possible for our students uh, on an IEP or students who are learning the English language or students who may just need that extra support of a teacher. So what we did was we started our guiding principles and we began looking at how many of our students we could bring back to school in person. And then we looked at how many of our students would have to be part in person and part remote. And I'm gonna go into the details of the plan in a little bit. And then the third option is a remote learning plan. And this is a plan that parents can choose from the beginning of the school year, and it's going to be wholly remote. Uh, we're gonna go into that in a little bit later too, but these were the three different plans that we had to develop for the state that I had to submit on December, uh, January 30th, June, July, July. Can you tell that these, this has been a long month? On July 31st, tomorrow, uh, what the details of our three plans are. So if you look at the learning continuum here, we have the COVID-19 rates. And right in the middle is that hybrid plan that we were talking about, where some of our students will come to school every single day, five days a week, some students will be part of the hybrid plan that is part at home and part at school. And that is where we are going to be starting and where the commissioner suggested we start. Now, if you look at the lower end of the continuum, where it looks like the traditional school day, that'll happen when COVID-19 disappears and is no longer an issue. For example, if there's a vaccine. Um, and then if you look at the higher end of the COVID-19 rates, if there is a spike uh, then we're going to have to move to a temporarily online, which is a fully remote for even students who are part of the school and at home, it's going to move to a temporarily online format. Now that would be the example if you are a member of the hybrid. And for example, there is a, a spike in our community and we work with the Board of Health and she tells us we need to close the school district down then we would close the school district down and all students would access the curriculum with their teachers uh, on a remote basis. There's also the example uh, that somebody mentioned about what if a staff member gets uh, COVID-19 or if somebody in the classroom tests positive. There are strict guidelines that we need to follow and we will follow them and you could access, the, access them yourself uh, on the DESE website about start and stop protocols, but there is the potential that students could move to a two week temporarily online uh, remote format, even if they are part of the hybrid, depending on uh, the, what happens with the COVID virus throughout the school year. So what I'm going to present to you tonight is really exciting. And I know it looks like a simple slide when you're looking at it, but there's so much work that went behind putting this plan together, looking at staffing, looking at classroom spaces, uh, figuring out how to cover contractual issues. But it's exciting to say that the Southwick Powell and Granville Regional School District will be able to provide in-person instruction for all of its students on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday with a half day on Wednesday. What we're able to do in order to accommodate this is we are able to use additional interventionist staff and turn them into uh, class teachers. So for example, our first grade will have a class size of anywhere between 10 and 15 students, uh, depending on the size of the classroom that the teacher is teaching in. Uh, kindergarten is about 13 to 16, and second grade is similar. So what we did was we looked at all the spaces and we looked at how we could fit our students in with getting as many of our dependent learners in as possible. They will be having limited contact with other students, even though they are in the school setting. Uh, there's a lot of information that is going to be uh, released tomorrow in our reopening uh, plan, which is about 15 pages. It will be online. But the school day will look and will feel different. Um, kids will be staying in their classrooms more. 
uh, teachers will move in and out of their classrooms as opposed to students going into other classroom spaces. And in order to accommodate all of our students pre-K through four on a daily basis, we may have to have more than one tier of transportation. Grades five through 12 are going to be a little bit different. Their true hybrid model that I was referring to at the beginning, where they get part of their instruction at home and they get part of their instruction uh, in person at school. So we have a few cohorts. We have cohort A. And as you can see, cohort A is students who reside in Tolland and Granville and students who are part of our school choice program who live in Southwick with last names beginning with the letters A through J. And that cohort, they will intend in-person learning on Mondays and Tuesdays, and they will have remote learning on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Again, this allows for smaller cohort sizes, and it also uh, avails ourselves to more transportation for more families in grades five through 12. Cohort B, is going to be students uh, who have last names with K through Z, who are either in school choice or who do reside in Southwick, and our students who participate in our MECO program. And they will attend in-person learning on Thursdays and Friday, and they will have remote learning Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And again, it allows for the smaller cohort sizes and is going to be grouped for transportation. Now, I do wanna say, that the hybrid models are going to differ between fifth and sixth grade and seventh through 12th grade. Uh, in fifth and sixth grade, you're going to be paired with teachers and one teacher will be teaching you your uh, in-person learning and another teach, teacher will be teaching you your uh, remote learning. At seven through 12, their hybrid model is you will be assigned a teacher and you will be learning uh, remote learning and in-person learning uh, with your same teacher. Uh, cohort C, uh, this is the group that DESE has asked us to prioritize with uh, getting our students in uh, as much as possible. So students in grades five through 12, similar to pre-K through four, but students who are our English language learner, learners, students who um, are identified with special needs or identified possibly in our lowest 25%, uh, we're going to do our best to get these students in, in, to attend school in person daily with Wednesdays being half days. Um, the school district and uh, your child's teachers will be determining um, what children qualify for this based on the criteria and you will be notified if your child qualifies. You don't need to call us and ask us. We will reach out to you and let you know that your child um, qualifies for the five-day in-person instruction uh, in grades five through 12. This is a sample of what the classrooms look like with the six-foot distance. The first picture is one at Woodland School. Uh, the next one is Powder Mill School. And then there's a picture of Southwick Regional School. So it looks like, I always say, the 1950s classroom where the desks are in rows and kids are sitting one in front of the other. But they are spaced out by six feet. And as I said, um, our supervisor of buildings and grounds, uh, Eric Wykander, has been instrumental in uh, figuring out the classroom designs, figuring out how many students we can get in a classroom. And the custodial crew has worked so hard uh, since the beginning of June to get these classrooms ready for all of you at the beginning of the school year. So again, can't thank them enough for their work they're doing, the moving of furniture, uh, the moving things around based on principal's requests and your flexibility. So thank you very much. And then there is the full remote option. So I wanna make it very clear that parents are going to have a choice between the full remote option and the hybrid option. The full remote option is going to be what we're going to refer to as, as cohort D. And because the state has not come out with the name of the program that they're going to be using. We have just um, put it in parent, uh, parenthesis, uh, quotations as the Massachusetts Virtual Academy. Not the name of it, it's a great name, but uh, just to make it very clear that this is a full remote option where your child will get instruction at home, grade level content for a full day by a teacher 
It will not necessarily be a teacher from the Southwick Pelling Granville Regional School District. Uh, it will be more of a learning management system that the state will be providing. But the children and your, the students will remain uh, members of the STGRSD and they would be able to participate in any extracurricular offerings as long as they remain in good standing in the full remote option. So the next steps. So in order to make this plan become reality, we're going to need help from the community and from our teachers. So the first thing we're going to be doing is the school committee is going to be taking a vote on uh, the plan that they're going to approve. And I will be recommending the hybrid plan and also the full remote plan. And the parents are going to have to complete a student enrollment form, letting us know what plan do you want to enroll your, your child in? Uh, you have those two choices right now. And then we're going to need staff to submit any leave paperwork so that we can start staffing our classrooms uh, appropriately and providing any necessary accommodations that we can to teachers. And once we get both those pieces of information, this is where it gets fun. We can actually start um, assigning kids to teachers and we can uh, start making uh, the fall 2020 a reality. At the same time, we're going to ask parents on the enrollment form uh, whether or not their child is going to need transportation. Um, transportation, we're going to have a presentation on Tuesday night on transportation, but the, because of the social distancing on the buses, they're only going to be filled at about a third capacity. So we're really going to be uh, seeking uh, children who really need that uh, ride to school and really need that bus route for their parents to check that they need transportation. And once we get that information, we will start creating bus routes. And then we are going to work on a phased reopening. Um, it was announced just the other day that the first 10 days of school are now going to be used for the much needed training on the safety protocols and on the professional development our teachers are going to need in order to make this work. But this is all brand new to all of us. Uh, we really are gonna have to take this slow in order to make sure that we do it right and we do it correctly and we do it safely. So we are going to be working with uh, the, the union leadership, and I know the schools have their site-specific reopening task forces on what works best at each school. And we're really going to be listening to our parents, to our teachers, and to our administrators on what you need from us at central office in order to make your reopening of the fall successful. So again, these are our next steps. We need your, after the school committee votes, we will be uh, sending out a student enrollment form with a deadline on it. Um, we're gonna, as soon as we get that information back, we will look to see how many of our children are opting in for the hybrid and how many are going to be opting in for the wholly remote. Now again, this is our plan today, based on 100% of our students returning to school. If we just see later that we have a large group of students who are opting for the remote, I will come back to the school committee and I will say, you know, this is what I see best. Our commissioner has tasked us with being flexible and fluid. And I've learned one thing this summer, it's to be flexible and fluid. So this is the plan right now based on the information that we have, but we are always work, willing to work with the community and our teachers and uh, make this reopening in fall 2020 a success. So I just want to say quickly and in closing, I just really believe that we have a plan that is reasonable and is safe. And this model will allow our students to come back to be with the teachers that they so desperately love and for our teachers to make those connections with the students that they so desperately miss. And uh, I just want to say that our teachers have been working all summer on professional development, uh, learning and reinventing their craft so that they can bring content to students in a way we never imagined. So this is our promise to you, and we are going to be looking for feedback from students, staff, committee members, and community members um, about our plan. We know it can't address every individual person's needs, but it is based on safety and best educational practice. Thank you.
Do school committee have any questions for me? Hi, Jen, it's John. I got a couple more things um, that I just was curious about that I'm writing down here as we went along. Um, the first thing is, uh, for the remote learning plan, um, if, if parents were to opt into that program and their children had, you know, special needs or an IEP plan, how would that be handled given that we're talking that there's potential that the, their instruction wouldn't be through the, uh, it wouldn't be through the school can you say that again? I'm sorry, Jonathan. Yeah, the, if, if a student has an IEP plan and their parents decide that they're going to opt for the remote program, how will we still, how will we still give them what they need as far as, uh, you know, the plans that they have if they're choosing a plan that may take them outside of the school district for instruction? That, that, that is addressed in our uh, plan, and I do have Robin Gutt on the phone, but I can just assure you that no matter what uh, plan parents choose, we are obligated as a school district to provide uh, special education services. And before the start of the school year, uh, the team will meet and will communicate with the families on how to best meet those needs. But I can open it up to Robin if she has anything additional she would like to add. Thanks, Jen. I would just echo what you said, that it is, that it is our responsibility to provide the services that students have on their IEPs. And so we will do that regardless of the, of the program that is chosen. And the, the decisions will be made on an individual basis based on what the, the students need. Okay, great to hear that. I just want, I figure, I mean, you guys have been on top of a lot of things here and done a lot of great work. I just, you know, just double checking some things here that uh, popped into my mind. Um, the one other thing I've been thinking about for the last week or so is in regards to when we put information out and maybe some of the sports coming, you probably have talked about it already, but I think that would be really helpful for parents to see something along the lines of what a day in the life looks like going to school for their kids, like at each grade. Um, you know, for example, I get, you know, what are the procedures going to be like for drop off and then they're going to go to their classroom. And then, you know, I know we've put some stuff in there and seen some stuff about they're going to eat lunch here. I, I can't remember seeing if they're going to be allowed to have recess or things like that. But if we put something out, it just said, here's what a typical day is going to look like for a first grader, a fifth grader, an eighth grader, um, just to give them a clear idea of what the day looks like. So that is another great question, and you will have answers to that on Tuesday. Our principals will be attending the school committee meeting on Tuesday, and we will have some sample schedules for you about what a, a day looks like, also what a remote learning day will look like. I need to assure families, and I'm sorry, students out there, but a remote learning day will not look like it did in the spring. It is going to mirror a real school day. Uh, with active participation, uh, active enrollment, uh, active participation on um, um, the students' part, attendance will be taken and grades will be issued. So it is going to be a real school day, even if you are at home. Um, and I know that was a, a, a point that our teachers raised, they would like it to be more structured, our parents raised it and our students raised it. So we did hear you, it's going to be a very structured day, um, with uh, times at, to check in with your teacher. And I don't want to use the word check in, time for instruction with your teacher that mirrors your regular in person learning. Okay. And, and the last thing for I'll, I'll stop hogging all the questions here. Um, we talked last time about the, the deadline for making this choice. And obviously, since then, we've had the pushback of school 10 days, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, do we have a new deadline for when? Uh, parents are going to have to fill out this paperwork we're talking about? Yes, so we are going to be, after the school committee takes a vote, because this isn't a plan and it's not what the right. plan can actually be until the school committee takes a vote on it, um, we will be sending out the enrollment paperwork uh, next Wednesday after the school committee vote. And we are going to ask parents, um, give them about a week, so it'll kind of be about two weeks from today, um, we're going to be asking for uh, the deadline for their paperwork. Just so we, because we have to start putting classrooms together and start designing bus routes. We know it's not ideal turnaround time. We know it's a huge decision, 
Uh, but in order for us to open up on time, we really do need to know uh, how many students are going to be participating remotely and how many students will be uh, attending the hybrid model. Great. And just for anybody who had to look through the, through the thing there, there's also a note about uh, if you opt into, say, the remote learning, that you'll have a chance to come back uh, in February if you want to, right? Yes. Um, potentially sooner. But the reality is we are a small school district. And because of the social distancing guidelines and because of the uh, limited number of teachers, especially at the high school level who teach certain subjects, we can't just fluidly move kids in out of classrooms like we used to because of the cap size. So if we're able to do it before February, we absolutely would. Uh, if not, um, there's always the chance to opt back in to hybrid if you chose the wholly remote uh, for the second semester. Okay, thank you. Jen, I have a question because I'm sure a lot of our teachers are listening. What are they supposed to do with their like fifth and sixth graders if they're working Monday through Friday, but their kids are only home, their kids are home three days a week? Do they get to send their kids more often or? So there was that talk. That way our teachers can still be working. Right. So there was talk of that. Um, there's still talk about that amongst uh, superintendents. Uh, I know one school district, they did it by their round table that any teachers who live within a certain round table, it's a cohort of uh, schools that work together. We are part of the Lower, Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative and, and we were discussing it today. So no definitive answers yet, but we are thinking about it in order to uh, do what we can to bring our teachers who are essential workers back to school and seeing if we can accommodate them but I have no guarantees or nothing definitive yet, because again, it would be, have to be all of us willing to uh, do it to make it work. When we decide about, um, or when parents have to answer the questions about whether our kids need transportation or anything like that, will we be given um, start times or are those going to need to be adjusted based off of the answers from that survey? Great question, Chelsea. We don't have start times yet because it's all dependent on how many students we need to transport to the regional school in case there's one tier or two tiers. And it's all going to be dependent on that. So the sooner we get the information, the sooner we can get the information out about bus times. And so that's why we're asking parents, um, if at all possible, if you could make the commitment to drive uh, your child to school. I know it's not ideal and it is a big ask. I'm a mom, I get it. Um, but just to do what we can uh, to really pull together as part of a community and uh, do what we can in order to uh, make this work for everybody. Any other questions for Superintendent Willard? There's just one other thing I, I, I did not bring up. It is in the district reopening plan. Um, the students who attend CTEC, as of right now, the CTEC guidelines just came out today. Um, and I will be having a meeting with our representative, uh, the new uh, ed leader over at the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative, uh, Roland Joyle. Uh, but we are uh, planning on sending our students to the CTEC. Uh, so if they go into the morning, they will go to the morning program. I believe it's grades 9 and 11 will go to uh, CTEC in the morning, and then they will take two remote classes in the afternoon. And the 10 and 12th grade students who go to CTEC, they will take two remote classes in the morning, and they will attend CTEC in person in the afternoon. So they will attend out of five-day schedule but their, their classroom instruction will be remotely and their CTEC will be in person five days a week. Any other questions for Superintendent Willard before we move on? Okay, moving on. So before we get into the revised calendar, I just want to uh, 
thank everybody that's joined us this evening. Probably one of the largest attended meetings we've had online so far. Um, we have the Q&A on by accident this evening. Uh, apologize to the folks that are trying to use that. Um, it's not an option during this public meeting. Uh, so if you wish to submit a public comment, please do so by emailing the superintendent email address. Make sure your name and address is included in the communication. And we'll read that communication at our separate public comment later in this meeting. Okay, so moving on to the calendar. Oh, I do have a week. Can I go back for a last minute question? Sure. Um, I'm just thinking about there were so many kids potentially. I mean, I just know from my pers or professional experience that potentially could have been waiting um, to be assessed for specialized education. Um, they were getting their testing done. Can, um, I'm just wondering if those kids can be kind of on the radar for the five day a week because they potentially could have been put on an IEP um last spring i don't know I don't i'll have know. robin answer that for you i know she's been okay. working on that yeah it's a it's a great question and the evaluations are absolutely at the at the forefront of our thinking right now um the school psychologist and i are going to look at what is involved in those lists fortunately mm -hmm. for pre-k through four all of the kids are coming back and so we will look at referrals for five through 12, the ones that we've received to this point. And, and yes, make those a, a priority as well as our pre-K students um, in terms of evaluations, getting those done as soon as we can. Thank you. So this is an interesting school calendar. None like I ever thought I would bring forward. Um, but with the new commissioner guidance and the new uh, MOU between the MTA and the uh, state of Massachusetts, our, our teachers and our uh, paraprofessionals are going to be returning to school and getting the training on our first 10 days of school. I know that sounds like a lot to some people, but you really need to understand it really isn't. Our teachers are going in uh, to a new environment, one that they've never been part of before, uh, one that we are um, creating this summer. It's going to be our new normal, but in order to make it a successful opening and to make learning the best it can be for all of our students, we really need to take the time at the beginning of the school year and to do it correctly. We need to provide them the professional development uh, to teach remotely. Um, I know a lot of the feedback that parents received, uh, parents uh, provided, and that we received from our teachers was that the remote model did not work in the spring. Um, it was really difficult with just check-in. I can assure you that on Monday night, we will have samples for you to look at on a uh, daily basis for what a day would look like at Woodland. What would a day at Powder Mill look like? What would a day at the regional school look like? What a remote day would look like? Uh, this is new for our teachers, and we need to make sure that we have this all done well before we uh, bring our students back. So with our new model, our teachers will still be starting on August 31st, and our students' first day will be September 15th. Now, I just want to let you know that not all students will be returning to school on the 15th, because as I stated, we are going to do a phased reopening uh, with limited grades coming in to uh, practice and to provide the safety protocols in an organized, controlled way. Uh, you also see that on every Wednesday is a, a half day. Uh, that is necessary because we have teachers who are teaching parts of the week uh, and to a group of students in person. And we have teachers who are going to be teaching those same students at home remotely. Uh, they need to spend that afternoon collaborating together and creating plans so that there is what we call synchronous learning happening so that all students are receiving the same instruction on the same day. Uh, at the seventh and eighth grade, uh, you will not just have one teacher teaching you all your subjects. You will still have your t teachers teaching you all your different subjects, but you'll be staying in the classroom and the teachers will be coming to you. But so this Wednesday half day is necessary for planning purposes. It's necessary 
because we're going to be switching between cohort A and cohort B in some schools. And our custodians are going to need some more time uh, to do a deep clean of the building or a deeper clean on Wednesday before the new cohort comes in. Uh, the other change you will see is that uh, we moved the uh, PD day that was on November 3rd and we moved it to that Wednesday just to keep it simple uh, and organized for parents who are looking at how to schedule the school year. We're just trying to keep as many days as half days or days off of school on Wednesdays as possible. And then you'll also notice that the three days before Christmas, the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd, those were originally uh, student school days. However, we're going to be moving them to professional development days uh, based on the needs of the teachers before we start second semester. A second semester will be starting on February 1st. So we're going to know what our teachers need for an effective transition between the first semester and the second semester and have a few days with our teachers uh, to give them what they need before we move into the second half of the school year. Uh, we did remove uh, Friday half days and we moved them to Wednesdays um, to try and make this school year as difficult as it's going to be with scheduling. Um, easier to remember if you can think of Wednesdays as either going to be a half day or um, no day of school. There are a few weeks where we have legal holidays, so we remove that half day in the middle of the week. For example, the week of October 12th, uh, it's a day off, so we would have an A co cohort on the 13th and the 14th, and then the B cohort on the 15th and the 16th. There would be no half day that week. But besides that, those few weeks where there's the legal holiday, every Wednesday will be a half day for our teachers and a full remote learning day for our students. And our last day of school does remain on June 17th. Any questions from the committee? One change, I'm sorry, Chairman Houle, was uh, due to the delayed start at the beginning of the school year, they did move graduation up until June 12th. Uh, to get the uh, correct number of school days in. Time on learning requirements. Any questions from the committee? Chairman Hull, I do want to um, mention one thing. It's not part of the calendar, but it is a discussion that we are having at the state level. Um, because that we are going to be able to teach remotely at any given time, uh, we are looking at the uh, elimination of snow days, where we might be able to tell kids today is a remote learning day. Similar to the blizzard, blizzard bags of uh, the last few years that school districts weren't really prepared to teach remotely with, well, now we are. And so we're hoping that with this new form of instruction, that snow days will be a thing of the past and that June 17th will be the last day of school. You might have to take into account uh, no uh, power outages. Exactly. That would be something that would not be able to make it a remote learning day. Okay, unless there's any questions, we're going to move on to policies. And we have none this evening to review. Action items. And reports. I do not have any reports. Um, just again, I do have one thing I would like to share though. I would uh, like to just give a huge shout out uh, to uh, the senior class officers and uh, the senior class advisors, the town of Southwick Board of Health Director, Tammy Spencer, um, the local Southwick uh, Police Department. And I ha don't have the thank yous or the words to uh, express my appreciation and gratitude for to Principal Termel and Jim Ash. Uh, our, the graduation last Saturday was something that 
I never dreamt I would see uh, when we were talking about graduation. And I have to say it was so beautiful and so well done and such um, the perfect ceremony for the class of 2020. Um, I just need to say thank you uh, to them and for all their work and all their dedication, uh, the class officer's commitment right up until the day of graduation, uh, advocating for their class and Principal Trammell uh, out there with shorts and a t-shirt on getting the chairs perfectly set up six feet apart before uh, he put a suit on for graduation. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim Ash. We are going to miss you terribly, um, but there's always a place for you in our school district. So thank you, everybody. Mr. President, do you have anything for Director of Finance and Operations tonight? <laughs> Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to take a, a brief uh, few moments to update the committee on status of our uh, orders for student devices, uh, technology devices. Uh, as you know, the 1920 school year was the first year of our four year uh, phased uh, plan to uh, bring the district to a one to one um, situation. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic certainly threw some uh, curveballs at us and we had to quickly shift some of our plans around that to um, allowing devices to be brought home uh, because of shortages within individual households. Um, the instructional technology planning team uh, has been working uh, extra hard to identify uh, needs and come up with plans for ensuring that we have enough devices for the upcoming school year. Um, based on, because of some of the additional COVID relief grants that were made available by the federal government through, through the Commonwealth, uh, we were able to actually accelerate our orders to uh, basically get to uh, year three instead of year two in terms of our phase in of the one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, however, um, as you might expect, despite our uh, efforts at getting our orders in early and we began ordering devices in uh, mid-May and in early June, which uh, typically might have a 30 to 60 day lead time before they landed in, in our laps, and uh, could get the additional work that, need, that needs to be done to them before they are deployed of uh, getting them imaged and set up on our network and entered into our asset management system. Um, we've just been getting a, uh, a couple of, uh, suffered a couple of blows to the timing of the receipt. Um, there was an issue involving a change to specifications that Lenovo uh, adopted with the preferred model uh, that we had, had uh, agreed to last year. Um, that took some time to work through that. Uh, eventually, we were able to replace that order uh, with Lenovo uh, through our, our local uh, partner, Wally Computer Associates. And... Um, and then subsequent to that, um, we were notified that the ship date was looking instead of uh, a late August or early September ship date uh, that we were anticipating, it got moved back to October 7th. And then just a little more than a week after that, we were notified by uh, Wally that uh, due to some supply chain and trade situations with, uh, between the US and China, which is affecting uh, major technology uh, producers like Lenovo, Apple, and several other of the, the large uh, tech manufacturers uh, that they're anticipating an additional three to four week, um, weeks of delay. So between the, those delays and the time it takes to get the devices uh, ready for deployment, um, we're probably out in the, until part of November. Um, we're working on uh, scrambling some options to uh, allow us to meet the needs of families. Uh, I can't tell you how that's going to play out just yet. Um, we should know more um, by this time next week, um, but we're working diligently to, uh, to come up with a solution that gets through um, a 
at least that November period when we can expect to start seeing the devices that we ordered um, in hand and, and available for student use. Um, so I, I did want to make you folks aware of that and um, we'll keep you apprised as uh, the situation uh, develops. Any questions for Jen or Steve? Okay, moving on. Steve, have we set a finance com committee date yet? I know you mentioned it last week and... I did and, and we have not. Um, I'll take a look at this uh, calendar again tomorrow and uh, offer some suggestions. Okay. Via email. Uh, let's see, Pam is out this evening, so I don't have a Board of Governors update. Uh, board of Directors have not met. Uh, policy subcommittee, do you guys have a date set? Because we're going to be uh, working diligently on a mask policy for the schools. I think we're meeting um, next week, but we haven't actually picked a date. Things have just been a little crazy. Okay. Does anybody else on any other subcommittee have anything to report? Mr. Poole? Yep. Uh, you might want to uh, scratch off the transportation. Correct. We will uh, eliminate that subcommittee. Okay, moving on. It's time for our second public comment. I'm gonna ask Amy to check the superintendent email account. Okay, Chairman Hull, I have two public comments. The first one is from Janet Brown. Uh, she did not identify her town. Um, her comment is, can you speak to what the remote learning day structure and curriculum will look like? I have another comment from Ian Brown of Granville, Mass. And Ian states, while I applaud the ability to fit as many students into a classroom as possible, I still have massive concerns of how logistically you can pull it off. For instance, if it requires 10 additional days of training for staff, when, where, and how will you adequately train your substitute teachers where will you even find substitute teachers? And that concludes the public comments in the email. Thank you. Okay, moving on to committee discussion. Uh, first we have old business. So old business wise, I've asked you folks to email me if you have any interest in changing subcommittees. Uh, I've not heard from folks yet. So uh, please let me know uh, if you're interested in staying where you are or if you're interested in, in, in moving on to a different subcommittee uh, so we can get reorganized uh, prior to September. I got a list of the subcommittees, although I know it's on the screen, I guess, go out just as a jumping point. Sure. So yes, can you I, send that file where we kind of give a brief overview of each committee and the, the schedule, the time commitment and stuff? Yeah, I'll send that to all the committee members. Perfect. Okay, and for new business tonight, um, we will be scheduling meetings more frequently uh, for the rest of the summer. I had a call today with uh, Amy and Jen to discuss uh, a meeting for next Tuesday. Um, tentatively, we're going to try to meet with the committee in person and broadcast the meeting uh, using Zoom for the public. Uh, we will be meeting at the high school library. Um, that is not finalized yet, so please keep your eye on the emails. Uh, we just want to verify with our lawyer that we're not violating any open meeting rules uh, by doing it with that format, um, but we're trying to uh, 
Let's get the committee back together to do uh, an in-person meeting while we broadcast. Um, secondly, it looks like we're going to meet weekly until the beginning of school. So we will try to stick to the Tuesday schedule. Uh, but I just want folks to know that we're probably going to have to meet every week as information and plans continue to evolve um, with the district. Do you have any concerns or questions with that? Do we have too many people to try to hold it in a classroom as if we were our students? I think the concern is we kind of need to spread out a little bit using Zoom so that we don't get the echo in the technology. All right. That was a thought process. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, did I miss anything? Did I cover it all? Yep, I think we got it all. And just to kind of mention for the community members who we've had really great attendance at the webinars, which is why we'd like to maintain the Zoom broadcast. Uh, of the meetings. So um, if anybody has a question of why are we going to zoom in a room together, it's really so that the community can um, participate in the meeting in real time. And Amy, just one more thing I'd just like to add. Uh, we will be having a copy of this PowerPoint and the uh, in-depth uh, 16, 15, 16 page plan uh, on our website tomorrow that does offer a little bit more detail than what we went into tonight, but it will all be readily available to the public tomorrow. I was watching the uh, Long Meadow com School Committee meeting this week and they also tried to use like a, um, I think it was an auditorium to hold their meeting, but everyone was still on Zoom. Um, but they also invited some members of the public, whoever they could fit into the room, um, six feet apart. And I thought that was a creative idea, except when they went for public comment, you couldn't hear a thing. There was definitely some audio issues. So as creative as that is, I think as much as long as we can try to make sure everyone's heard correctly, I'm with you on that. I don't know. <laughs> creative but audible. <laughs> Hey team, that's all we had on the agenda. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. For roll call vote. Chelsea? Yes. Ted? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is yes. Motion passes 600. Thank you all for attending this evening.